have not signed into Facebook, you can do so at this time. Um, also, what we would like you to do is to put your phones on airplane mode so you're not stealing our bandwidth when what so we can broadcast a little bit better. Um, other than that, I think we're going to get started here in a few minutes. I'm just waiting for Joe to go like that to me. So when he does that, I know I'm supposed to start. There we go. I'm supposed to start talking. We're live. Okay. We're live, Cindy. God, giver of grace and love, our creator, Christ, and guiding Holy Spirit. We invite you into our small group that has gathered here to worship you. We understand that where only two or three gather in your name, you will also be there. And so we lift our voices, our hearts, and our whole being to give you honor and all glory and power. For you are the one that is worthy. For you are the creator, the redeemer, and the only one that has always shown your love to all. Help us open our hearts that we too can display this love to the world that is truly in need of love and reconciliation. We thank you for who you are in the name of Christ and the spirit that guides us. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Ah, okay. I, I was wondering if anybody was out there. <laughs> so when I put on my when I put on my bifoc or my, my reading glasses, I can't see that far, so I'm just assuming that you're out there. Hey. hey welcome. <laughs> um, welcome here to Faith Family United Church of Christ. Here at Faith Family, we are an open and affirming congregation. 
We believe that all children, God's children, should be welcome here to worship with us. Um, here at Faith Family, we like to say, no matter where you are on life's journey or where you are on your spiritual journey, you, you are, are welcome, welcome here. here. Amen. Inclusiveness, key word. Um, we are going to go ahead and get started right now with our call to worship. Um, open the eyes of my heart. So I want to hear everyone singing with this one. And I even want to hear the people out there on Facebook land. I want to hear you singing. I want to hear it coming through the door because the door's open right now. So I want to hear everyone singing this song. Open the eyes of my heart. together in harmony for the good of all. This we pray. Lord, for those suffering from natural disasters, especially the wildfires, wildfires on the West Coast, this we pray. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. For an end to human violence everywhere, this we pray. Lord, Lord, hear our prayer. That we Christians everywhere receive the grace to consider the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ before our own wants, this we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For those around the world and here in our country where cases of COVID-19 continue to surge, for our teachers, for our school kids as they return to the classroom, and for those anxious about their future, this we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those who give of themselves so that others may be helped, the doctors, the nurses, the healthcare workers, EMTs, police officers, firefighters, mental health professionals, and countless others. May they receive the protection they, as they serve. This we pray. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all those that are sick, especially those with COVID and their, and their caregivers. We ask prayers for Jim Kuba and Dean. Dean is dealing with uh, neuropathy and dementia. We ask healing prayers for Bill Harbath. We ask prayers for a family member dealing with cancer, breast cancer. We ask prayers for my sister and brother on the loss of um, um, an upcoming surgery. 
And Joe and Scott asked for travel mercies as they head out on a three-week road trip. Oh God, we ask that you hear these prayers and keep you keep them in your word. This we pray. Lord, hear our prayers. We ask prayers for all those who have passed away. We pray for the family of Andy Turek who passed this past week and his spouse Eddie. May Andy and all those who have passed celebrate everlasting life in Christ's joy. This we pray. Lord, hear our prayers. Let us pray for our congregation that we may grow in faith and confidence that God is present among us and that we might be agents of that presence. This we pray. Lord, hear our prayers. For all who share the ministry of this community, that they may bring compassion and understanding to those in need. This we pray. Lord, hear our prayers. For all those that we have been asked to pray, for the requests that have been typed in this Facebook live stream, and those intentions that we hold in the silence of our heart. This we pray. Lord, hear our prayers. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. I love that song. Now's the time that uh, in our service that we get to share the love and peace of God with each other. We're not there yet. We'll get there soon. We'll be hugging on each other and, and just spreading the love. My wife's sitting there. No, no. This will be the longest part of our service um, once we start doing that again. And, and there's certain people that don't like to be hugged that you really want to hug. <laughs> so, as we share the love and peace of God with each other, um, we're doing it from a social distance and, and doing air hugs. And to you out there in Facebook land, love and peace to you, love and peace to everyone. Amen. Love you, A reading from John 41 through 51. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, Do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by my father, who sent me. And I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Thank you, Jack. <coughs> Y'all remember the Adams family? <laughs> there you go. Not long ago, they, they made a movie. They redid the Adams family from this TV series. And they made a movie about it. And uh, one of the scenes in the movie has Wednesday and Pugsley out front um, in a lim doing a lemonade stand. And this little Girl Scout comes and, and sees them. 
and she's got a snotty attitude. And she says, oh, is the lemonade made from real lemons? And uh, of course, Wednesday, she, she assures her that her lemonade is made from real lemons. Of course, you see the little potions sitting out there alongside the lemonade. So you kind of wonder what else is in the lemonade. But the Girl Scout decides that she's going to trade with Wednesday and Pugsley. She's going to sell them some of her Girl Scout cookies. In exchange, she'll buy some of their lemonade. And then the grape wine. Wednesday asks, well, are your Girl Scout cookies made with real Girl Scouts? <laughs> I love that. See, comedy uses euphemisms and metaphors. But when we take them seriously, or take them literally, it can make for a funny situation. Like a man walking down the street, trying to make a decision about his future that will change his whole life. He walks engrossed in prayer, his head down as he walks. He's so deep in his own thoughts, as he looks down, he's focused on nothing in particular. And he prays, God, I know this is what I should do, but I need a sign. And just at that moment, bam, he walks right into a stop sign. Doesn't touch. <laughs> See, when we take things literally, it can be funny. But sometimes taking metaphors literally can be tragic too. I recently read an article talking about the way people in leadership use metaphorical language to downplay serious failures that can cost people their lives. The article started out talking about the hospital, this one hospital where doctors compare infections caused um, when placing central IV lines, that's they go in with the IV and right underneath the subclavial or the collarbone, sorry, the collarbone and, and goes right down near the heart. So that's a central IV line. And they, they compare the infections that people get with this with car crashes. And they point out that there are so many cars on the road that it's inevitable that you're going to have a car crash. Well, the current research at other hospitals have shown that there should be no risk in this placement of the central IV lines. And the problem was actually in the neglect and improper dis, uh, uh, disinfection and sanitary procedures. So by taking the metaphor, literally, the healthcare workers were practicing poor techniques that led to the infections because they bought into the idea that the metaphor was true, that it's inevitable. The article went on to talk about COVID, of course, and the pandemic and the poor response of the leaders to give a realistic picture to the public and what they were facing. Some leaders pointed out that COVID was no more than the common flu, and we sure don't shut down our country for uh, we don't shut down our country for that each and every year. And others said uh, we lose more people in car accidents every year than we do with this COVID pandemic. April 2020 was when this uh, article was written, and yet nearly, and today, nearly a quarter of a million people have died from COVID. And still, we have people that are taking these metaphors seriously, literally about COVID. No mask, no vaccination. It's just like the flu. <coughs> Steering back towards our text. I was reading the other day about the early church. When I say early church, I mean pre-100. 
100s. And how, in the beginning, the church was so misunderstood that Christians were accused of some of the craziest things, such as incest. Incest. After all, don't we call each other brothers and sisters? And yet, we marry each other. So you can see the confusion. Christians were also, were also called atheists. Could you imagine thinking that you're an atheist? Well, they didn't go to the temples and worship other gods. They didn't give offerings. They didn't burn incense. And when they had festivals to their gods, they never participated. So obviously they didn't believe in God. They were atheists. And one that relates to our text today. They were accused of being cannibals. I mean, doesn't it say that we are to eat Christ's flesh? Hmm. Taking this metaphor literally, branded Christians, outlaws, deviates, and despicable people. So to confess that you were a Christian during this time was punishable by death. Again, taking a metaphor literally can literally kill you. So keeping that in mind, let us look at our text. First, why were the Jews so upset about Jesus, what he was saying? And I'll give you a hint. It wasn't anything about the eating of flesh. The issue with the Jews had to do with what he was saying. They understood the reference that he was making. The reference comes from Exodus 16. The history of the Jews wandering in the wilderness after being captive in Egypt. See, while they were wandering, food was scarce. And God sent down manna, which later became known as the bread. God sent the bread down from heaven to feed them when there was no food to be found. And Jesus, by calling himself the bread that came down from heaven, Jesus was equating himself with the manna. Not only was he equating himself with the manna, but he was saying he was better than the manna. Because their forefathers ate the manna and they still died. But if you eat of the bread of life, you have eternal life. The bread that sustained the life of the Jews is what Jesus was calling himself. He was saying, you, the Jews, would not be here today if it were not for me. The Jews were alive to this day because God, in the form of manna, came down in times of great despair to feed the nation and sustain it. Now, coming from a poor carpenter, Joseph's son, this was a great insult to the Jews. But, now before we can fully understand this passage, I want to look at four terms that it uses and see how they're used metaphorically and how we need to take them and apply them to what we're reading and what we're understanding. The first one, of course, is I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. Jesus is the life-giving substance that, that gives and continues to give life. Without food, bread was the food that sustained life in the time. That was the main meal. That was everything. If you had bread, you were going to be fed. But without that, you would die. Funny how things have changed from then to now, and yet how things are still the same. Today, we eat food. Today, eating food has been scientifically structured. We got the little pyramid, right? What you're supposed to eat. And yet, a lot of us. I just had McDonald's for breakfast. <laughs> there are those that eat junk food, all kinds of junk food. 
and which gives their body little nourishment, only filling their bellies and giving them the feeling of satisfaction. If we are not eating the food that nourishes our life, our life will show. And in the end, it could kill us. Now, I am the bread of life is so closely related to the very end where he says, my flesh. Okay. So the bread of life and Jesus' flesh, these terms come together. And it's basically saying that I have given all of myself, my body, all of my body. And you must partake of my body. Partake of all of me. Again, he uses the metaphor of the wandering in the wilderness to show the importance of eating this bread. And this bread is Jesus' life. To eat. Now, it says we must eat the bread. We must eat Christ's flesh. But in the Greek, there's, there's a broader meaning to this. And it's, it is to consume. Now, now, when we eat something, we think, okay, we eat, okay, we eat. But to consume something, it means, you know, think of the really good meal that you had, and you just want to eat it all up, you know. I, I remember this one time that um, uh, I was so blessed that my parents were able to come to us while we lived in Germany, and we went and we ate at this um, castle, and the castle had uh, its own reindeer, or deer, and they would serve it on the menu as steak, and I don't think, my, I'm glad my dad isn't here right now. But I don't think he knew that it was actually deer meat that he was eating. He just thought he was eating a steak. Anyway, um, he, took, uh, he didn't like the German food. But when we got there and he got the steak and everything, there was nothing left on the plate. He had consumed everything on the plate. And uh, that's the idea. When you consume something, you, you completely take it in. So that's a little bit more than just eating. And remember, you are what you eat. So when we take in Christ, we become more and more like Christ. And now coming back to the word flesh. Now flesh is not just, you know, I've got flesh on my skin, but rather it is my whole being. It is who I am. Remember, before Christ was here on earth in the flesh. He was with God, and he was God. And so, coming down, he put on the flesh. And so, he became a, a, a physical being instead of just the spirit of God that we know. And the one verse that I love so much, 1 John 4, 6, God is love. When Jesus put on flesh and came to earth, when Christ, I should say, put on flesh and came to earth, he became a physical manifestation of love. And that's the life that he lived. And so when he says, my flesh, he is talking about a life filled with now, the third one, or the fourth, excuse me, the fourth term that we're going to look at is believe. To believe, or to have faith, or to trust. And to do this, it says, have eternal life. If you believe, you have eternal life. Very, very, very truly, I tell you, whosoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of that's right in the middle of that passage, so sometimes we just kind of gloss over that because we've heard it so many times and we forget about it. But that is a beautiful promise. It is full of hope and reassurance. It fits what Jesus says other places where he says, 
I am the resurrection and the life. It's giving us hope. Leadership is a funny thing sometimes. You have leaders that seem to be only for themselves. They use the people that they have authority over so that they can make themselves great. Then you have leaders that are all about the goal. And of course, the glory that comes with that accomplishment. But every once in a while, there's a leader that comes along that sees the goal, but wants to make sure that everyone gets to the goal. There are those leaders that use their authority to blaze a path for those they lead. They take obstacles out of the way and stand in front of opposition so those they are leading can accomplish what they need to accomplish. For all, all for the sake of getting everyone to the goal. I liken it to a baseball catcher. I'm sure a lot of you know I'm a big Rays fan. Uh, and we love Mike Zanina, the catcher for the Rays. But what some people don't know, if you don't understand baseball, is how much he gives the pitchers um, their ability to do what they do. See, when a pitcher goes for a strikeout pitch, he'll throw a curveball. And a curveball will come in, and it looks like it's going to be waist high, and the guy's going to belt it out of the park only to the last second. It drops off and bounces, maybe hitting the plate, maybe right behind the plate. And the guy swings at the pitch, and he looks foolish because he's nowhere close to going to hit the pitch. But that's where Mike comes in. He falls to his knees. He makes himself big like a backstop. And the ball bounces off his chest and falls right in front of him. He picks the ball up and tags the runner out. Strike three, you're out. See, the pitcher has the trust that Mike is going to do that. So he is able to throw that pitch in the dirt and not worry that it's going to go to the backstop or it's going to go somewhere else or do something else and... Nobody else is going to run or nobody else is going to get on base because they have the trust in their catcher. So they can throw that wicked curveball. That's the kind of faith we should have in Christ. He has said that if you consume the bread of life, that is, if you take on a life like his, living a life of love, we will have eternal life. Your life will be eternal. Faith, trust, we must completely consume this bread, this life of love. We don't, if we don't, if we keep falling back and eating the junk food of this world, seeking power, seeking control over people, seeking revenge, acts that are selfish in nature. If we fall back into this style of life, we will soon starve of malnutrition. But when we eat the bread of life, when we live a life of love, when we completely consume ourselves in it, then we have eternal life. So let us not eat or so let us not eat or consume the bread of life, Jesus' life of love, but let us consume it. Let it be completely enveloped in us. And in times of hardship, and when we are in the wilderness of a hateful world, let us not eat of the junk food. 
but let us take the nourishment of the bread of life, a life of love. Amen? Amen. Amen. and earth, almighty spirit of truth and love. Savior Christ, we give thanks to you that you have plans for us that have not yet been revealed. You have given us gifts that we are to be, that we are to use for our goods and your glory. For you are love and may your love always reign. Lord, you have said, give and it will come back to you. For in the same measure as you give, it will be given to you again. We give to you today as a response to your goodness to us. We ask that you receive our offerings and continue to supply all our needs. Supply us with supply us as we seek to fulfill your mission here on earth on earth. A mission to love and reconcile all. May your peace be in our hearts, your grace be on our words, and your love be in our hands, and your joy be in our souls. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jesus. 
said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is not talking about the Lord's Supper. Rather, he's telling us what the Lord's Supper is all about. The Lord's Supper doesn't give eternal life Christ. Excuse me. The Lord's Supper doesn't give eternal life. Christ does through faith in his way of life. This food that Christ offers is to make him part of ourselves, which we do through faith. John 6.47 tells us, I tell you the truth, he who believes has everlasting life. The Lord's Supper, therefore, is a declaration of faith. When we partake of the communion, we are declaring that Jesus was right. His life of love and community is what the world was intended to be. When we consume those emblems, we declare that the Christ is more important to us than even food. For when we love, we will share our food. And when we are hungry without food, others will share with us. Just as Jesus skipped a meal on the day to tell the Samaritan woman about the good news, the truth about living a loving life of community. And that story comes from John chapter 4. Therefore, we are to eat spiritual food as well. More important than food, more important than life, is learning to live a life of love. And this life looks exactly like Jesus' life. We are called to believe that this is what life and the world was intended to look like from the very beginning. What God intended for the world to be. And as we believe, we choose to live as Christ lived. Full of love and compassion. And a life of community with everyone and with God. Then this is the point of communion. Spiritual food that reminds us to live a life of On the night that Jesus would offer himself that all might know love, he called to himself his disciples whom he loved and ate with them. At the meal he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. He said, it is my body broken for you. My heart fills with love, broken open for all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same, after supper, he took the cup of blessing, and he raised it up, and he said, Take and drink from this cup. It is the cup of the new covenant, a covenant of love that is without boundary or condition, the cup of love that is poured out for all. Do this in remembrance of me. Here at Faith Family, we believe in a open uh, communion service. That is, all are welcome, for it is the Lord who invites us. Um, let us go ahead and uh, do a prayer of transformation. Spirit of God, we ask that you sanctify the bread and this cup, this divine feast that you have invited us to partake. May you, may you transform it into spiritual food for our souls as it transforms us into living vessels of the Lord Christ. In Him, in us, and us in Him. All one body, the body of Christ, the body of love that is sent into the world as a self-giving part of your mission to reconcile all creation back to you. We ask a blessing on all of this congregation on all that are partaking of this spiritual feast here before us. Bless and prosper this meal. Bless and prosper the fellowship. Bless and prosper our lives so that justice and love may be measured, may be the measure of our common bond and reconciliation back to you all of the world. And this our our mission.
Let's go ahead and uh, stand as you are able and feel comfortable. Um, please use um, whatever is closest to your heart, the term closest to your heart for the divine, as we say the Lord's Prayer together. Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The body of Christ. cup of the new covenant. A prayer of thanksgiving. All-knowing and eternal God, you watch over your children with your tender and loving care. We thank you this day for your mercy and grace. We are grateful for your healing power and for the abundant blessings you have given us. But most of all, we are thankful for the promise of salvation, a way that we can experience the communion with all creation and with you. This you have given through your Christ, our Lord. Through him, when all is complete, there will be no more selfishness or hate, no more sickness or pain. We pray in the spirit of love, through Christ's name. Amen. Amen. At the cross, at the cross, 
I surrender my life, climb in all of you, climb in all of you, where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you, I owe all to you, at the cross, at the cross, I surrender my life, I'm in all of you. I'm in awe of you, where your love ran red and my sin washed white. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you. I owe all to you, you. Jesus. with a thank you for all the things that came in from Men's Elementary. Um, to be honest, when we started this campaign, I thought it's not going to be as much as we've given in the past year, but we'll just give what we can. And um, Randy's, Randy took the cause to his work, and it just filled in that gap. And I think we had more things this year than maybe we've had in previous years. And I just thought that's a real testament of what this church is about. And I want to challenge you when we have the Christmas for Mints to do the same thing. Reach out to where you work, to your neighbors, and again, maybe we can have an overwhelming success and really make an impact. And thank you, Sue, for taking all that stuff. And I'm just really proud of you. So as you all know, today after this, we're going to have a special called congregational meeting. So. Please stay. If you're watching at home, you should have a Zoom link to, to join in for um, the vote. Um, I can't think of anything else that we have to announce right now. I think that's about it. Oh, the council meeting, we're going to announce that. We'll probably have, in, this, in the early part of this week, we'll send out when the council meeting for August will take place. She's running our AV there. So she has to run all the way to the back. Exactly. Let us bless each other with a benediction. Christ has no body but ours, no hands nor feet nor wheels but ours. Ours the eyes through which Christ's passion is to look out on this world. Ours are the feet and the wheels which Christ goes about doing good. And ours are the hands which Christ blesses us now and blesses all the world. Amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be your name. When the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be, blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road, marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering, 
blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Wonderful God of grace and love, I ask a blessing on all here today. Fill our hearts with love so that as we go forth from this worship service, let us take with us the love that we have shared, your love, so that we can pour it out onto all we encounter, therefore changing this world into a world of love. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.